All right, so we're talking about uh, Pacelli uh, as the NCO to Germany. Uh, as early as the summer of 1918, the Holy See had commissioned him, as we said, to negotiate an agreement with the Soviets that would allow the Vatican to provide asylum for the imprisoned Tsar Nicholas and his family. So there was this idea, uh, so similar to ideas that there were at the time of the French Revolution, that the, the royal family, and the French royal family in that case, could be uh, uh, smuggled out of France and uh, take refuge someplace else, probably going to take refuge in England in that case. That's the general rule. If you are in, if you are in, in France and you get in trouble, take refuge in England. If you're in England and you get in trouble, go to France. <laughs> that's, that's how it's been for a long time. I remember that, the, for example, during the Elizabethan persecutions of the church in England, that uh, seminarians or future priests would go to France to study there. The English college moved around in France. So, you know, there, it existed in two different cities, which is the reason why uh, the, uh, the English translation of sacred scripture, the, the, the good one, the approved one, is uh, in, well, it was done in, in France. In fact, it's named the Douai Reims for that reason. The English college there um, it was in those two different cities. So uh, that was a case of if you're getting if you get in trouble, if England is is a, is a if is the source of immediate trouble, then you go to France. Uh, but also yeah, the French would sometimes take refuge in England when they would get in trouble. So the idea was to get them out of of, of France and and get them to some place of safety. They were unsuccessful in escaping. They were recaptured by the revolutionaries. Uh, but they, that was that idea. Maybe we can get them out and they can maybe go back at some point when things calm down a bit. Uh, or in this case, Tsar Nicholas, maybe we can get them out. Remember the first, there was the, that suggestion was floated also. Maybe they could go to England where they would be safe. Uh, all, those, all those ruling families were all related. That, uh, that the Tsar Nicholas's uh, wife, the uh, uh, Alexandra, was uh, a granddaughter of Queen Victoria, and in fact, it was the reason that was the reason why, very famously, uh, the the Russian Crown Prince Alexei had uh, was known as hemophilia. The essentially the the condition in, in brief, whereby it's impossible to stop bleeding. So even just some, someone with that condition could die from just a minor cut, could just bleed out through a minor cut because for whatever reason the blood will not stop flowing. It does not have the ability to coagulate as they call it. So um, the, that, that was how the easily the creepiest or one of the creepiest human beings ever photographed, uh, Rasputin became involved in the, with the Russian family, the Russian royal family, because he was somehow able to hypnotize the kid and get him to stop bleeding thereby. So that was that was how they got involved with him. Uh, as I said, if you ever see a picture of him, he's one, easily one of the creepiest human beings ever photographed. Uh, if not number one, he's in the running for it. So uh, all of that was going on in Russia at the time, but obviously that came to an end when they were executed brutally. The Tsar and his family were executed brutally July 16th and 17th of 1918. Uh, they were just shot. Uh, and the, the Tsar and his... Well, his son, the son, who was 13 years old at the time, they, they were killed immediately. It took a few more shots to kill the, uh, the former Tsarina and the, and the girls because they had, apparently, they were wearing jewelry or something, and so some of the bullets started bouncing off of them, but they eventually shot and killed them all in this um, brutal scene. And uh, as we said, some of, two of the children, as I recall, were buried someplace separate from the rest of the family, meaning that when they... Uh, where the, 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 the grave site, the, the burial site, was discovered later. Some of the, you know, I believe it was two of the bodies were missing. Uh, that gave rise to decades of speculation as to what actually happened to them. Maybe they escaped and survived. It turns out in, in recent years they, they discovered where the bodies actually were. So there's no, there's no chance that they actually survived that. But uh, there, that, that did persist for a long time. Uh, and since then, actually, uh, again, the Tsar... Uh, Nicholas II was, we've said before, a really a weak ruler who allowed the conditions of revolution to come into, a, uh, into place uh, that brought down his downfall, nor was that the first revolution that took place uh, during his reign. Uh, and when it was all breaking out, he very much set himself up as a scapegoat. He, he had that idea that I, I will be, I'll take all the blame for everything that's going wrong here. And that meant taking the blame for the 
endless series of disasters occurring in the war, They're one defeat after another in, in, uh, against, uh, against the Germans. They had some successes, some battlefield successes, uh, but uh, wherever they had success, it started coming to a halt wherever they met German troops on the battlefield. Had success against Austrian forces, but not against German forces. So they, uh, the Tsar had this idea that he would take upon himself all the blame for all of that, all of the blame for all of everything going wrong in the, in the, in the, in the empire, and eventually ended up um, abdicating uh, by the demands, or at the demands of the revolutionaries. Is replaced by a provisional government, which ultimately you could study the whole history of that, which is definitely not our focus here, but ended up resulting in the, um, well, the formation of the Soviet Union, uh, making Russia a fully communist nation. And also, the, something interesting to keep in mind is the fact that uh, Russia was not the first target of the communists. They were originally thinking they would turn England, actually, into uh, a communist nation. But that didn't work out the way they wanted it to, but they certainly tried. If you study the history of socialism, uh, today the UK is, you know, of course, heavily socialist. It's, uh, it's a sur really a surveillance state. Everywhere you go, there are security cameras. Uh, just ever. And they, have, they make it clear to you that there are security cameras everywhere, but there are security cameras everywhere. And it's a, there, there's a great deal of socialism there. It's been that way for a long time. And even to, during this whole period, the First World War, there were, there were a great many socialist uh, activists uh, around. I mentioned uh, the, the British Prime Minister, who's actually Welsh, David Lloyd George, was one of the, the voices at the, at, the, uh, at the conferences following the conclusion of, of the war, the, the, actual, the actual armistice going into effect in November of 1918. He was one of the voices calling for less harsh treatment of of Germany, he, there was an attempt to assassinate him at one point. Some socialists threw, threw a bomb at his car. Uh, and He survived it, but there was an attempt to assassinate him. So the, there was a great deal of socialist activism in England. Uh, there were stories of them, go, uh, some of them getting arrested and then going on hunger strikes and things like that. So there was a lot of that going on. There was a great deal of socialist activity everywhere during the war. And it had its, uh, the, when England failed to deliver, failed to um, conform, we'll say, to the agenda and did not become a communist state, uh, they decided to go for Russia instead, which was a less developed nation, which was true. It was a less developed nation where they thought they could impose this more easily. In fact, it was due to the fact that Russia was somewhat, was, well, somewhat, was definitely underdeveloped that France managed to forge its alliance with Russia. I uh, explained that yesterday that at one point the Kaiser made a case personally to the Tsar that we should be the nations that are allied. We are the conservative monarchistic nations. It makes, would make much more sense for us to, to align ourselves against uh, revolutionary France. And the, the Tsar personally agreed, but when he went back to Russia afterwards, he was talked back into for, uh, entering into an alliance with France by his ministers who were uh, enticed by French offers of developing Russia. That was part of the deal, was Russia will throw in its, its vast manpower uh, on, the side, on the side of France, uh, hemming in Germany. You know, that, was, that was the worst nightmare for the Germans, was to have to fight a war on two fronts, which is ultimately what they had to do. And uh, the, the idea was, uh, you, all, you will align yourselves with us, set yourselves up against Germany, and we will develop the nation. And they did. They did, in fact. The, the French indeed did that. They kept up their end of the deal uh, to the point that uh, when the Kaiser was, uh, and the Tsar also, as we saw, did not want the war to break out in 1914, that there were others who were lower than, than they who did. Uh, the, uh, the, the German high command especially, they were pushing for war at that time because they said if we, a few years more, say by 1917, this was 1914 that the war broke out and that actually they wanted it to break out, uh, they said we, we ha it has to be now because in a few years, say by 1917, we will not be able to defeat Russia because they will be, uh, they'll be able to mobilize quickly enough. The, the, the German plan for the war was quickly defeat France. Uh, with, a, with, with a quick, well-coordinated, well-organized movement having been planned for a long time in advance. Uh, let, we will quickly defeat France and then after that turn around to fight Russia. 
the idea being France will be defeated before Russia can mobilize, before they can bring their forces together. Yes, they have vast manpower reserves, but it will take them some time to bring all that together, the, co the infrastructure of the nation being underdeveloped as it is. So it will take time to, to bring together all those huge numbers of men across, uh, together from across such a vast territory on poor roads. Um, and few, few if any railroads. So that, that was the idea. But they saw that if France keeps developing Russia the way they are doing it, then by 1917, we, the Russia will be able to mobilize so quickly that we will not be able to defeat France quickly enough to then turn our forces to the east to defeat Russia. So, and, but actually, even as it was when the war, the war did then break out that year in 1914, uh, Russia mobilized much more quickly than the Germans were expecting. And that, that caused them some trouble. And they had, they, it turned out that Russia was really the, the least of their problems in a sense, uh, that the Russians were the least able to put up a fight against them in the field. But uh, all of this you know, is, uh, was a result that, that buildup of Russia was, was a result of, of, uh, uh, of uh, really French funding. Uh, they, they pumped all that into Russia. But the idea of, of forging a, a better, uh, Say, ma making Russia into a more useful tool for them to, to defeat Germany. So, uh, the Tsar was, was taken in by all those offers and was uh, ultimately, the, the war did not go well at all for Russia and the Tsar and his family were killed brutally in 1918. So, subsequently, in uh, March 1922, Pacelli was involved in the conclusion of an agreement with the Soviets for the Vatican to provide humanitarian assistance to its suffering population. Yes, in March 1922, remember the same year as the election to the papacy of Achille Ratti, uh, Pacelli was involved in the conclusion of this agreement uh, with the Soviets for the Vatican to bring humanitarian assistance to its suffering population. So as we saw, uh, I mentioned last time, uh, suffering and even war in general did not by any means end with the conclusion of official hostilities among nations in 1918. There was still a great deal of that, uh, but the, again, uh, Pacelli was, remember, one of his jobs was to negotiate secretly with the, uh, with the, uh, with the Soviet regime. So, do you have the notes? No, I didn't print the notes. Okay. All right. So this is a you know, general rule. The idea is that these notes are to be used to follow along during class. So. Uh, does anybody not have a copy of them with them, either printed or electronic? If not, then well, to make sure that there's someone with whom you can share. So, okay, then you can follow along with him. All right. Okay, so the, the, uh, the terms of this 13-point plan uh, proved restrictive for the church, which was prohibited from sending either pastors or missionaries to the Soviet state while its activity was limited to providing charitable assistance. In other words, uh, material assistance only, rather than setting up any kind of hierarchy or establishing um, uh, any kind of apostolate. So from the first, Pius XI boldly, as the Soviets charged blatantly, ignored these restrictions and proceeded to establish dioceses and a hierarchical structure that extended from Ukraine to Vladivostok, much to the displeasure of Lenin and the other Soviet leaders. So, uh, Lenin is, by this point, most definitely in power and I, uh, looking to uh, attack Poland, which there, I mean, there, was, a, there was a war in, in, in the early 1920s uh, between Russia and the newly, or Soviet Union by that point, and the newly uh, uh, you know, re-established Russian state. So, it was around this time that all that was happening. I have to check the exact dates of that war, but it was definitely early, early 1920s, and uh, Lenin is looking to establish this worldwide communist, uh, this communist collective. And uh, remember, it was Lenin who said that uh, it is necessary to eliminate, to erase from the, the, the minds of the population all idea of, of any kind of an afterlife, of any kind of deity, because if the people have any notion to that effect, they will not be, uh, they will, they will, they will not f uh, be committed to the idea of, of building paradise on earth here and now. And he said that. Uh, it's, a, it's a direct quote from him, in which I'm paraphrasing right now, but he put it just as clearly. 
So Pius XI grew increasingly skeptical that the Soviets desired an agreement with the Holy See. And all of this was done in secret anyway because the church did not want to recognize publicly um, the communist regime in Russia. So there was no official recognition, but this was all being done, all being done quietly. Uh, when he heard that they were ready to, Pius XI heard that they, the, the, the communists in Russia, were ready to execute a Catholic priest of Polish background, he ordered Pacelli to temporarily close the secret talks. So that's, uh, you see, this is, this, will be, this is a pattern that we'll see repeatedly here, uh, Pius XI getting uh, angry at something, and it's right, rightly so, it seems, but then always uh, 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 Pacelli, they are ready to, 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 to keep things moving as much as possible and to be the diplomatic one uh, in, in a situation in which Pius XI is, the, uh, is, is becoming in, practically well, quite infuriated and uh, uh, wanting to denounce, denounce people and take, uh, take very, very firm stances on things, whereas the Pacelli is always there to c continue the diplomatic course uh, as far as, as, per as, as might be permitted. So Pius XI did not abandon his Russian mission, but assumed a different course. And this is very interesting. In February 1926, he decided to send the French Jesuit Michel d'Aubigny to the USSR to consecrate bishops secretly and establish the hierarchy there. So, okay, fine, if they won't agree to let us do it, we'll, we'll go in anyway, but do it underground. Uh, Pius XI involved Pacelli in his plan by having the nuncio consecrate d'Aubigny a bishop before the latter's departure for the Soviet Union. So it was uh, Eugenio Pacelli, who had who himself a bishop, who, uh, by this point, who consecrated Debigny a bishop before then he went into Russia undercover. Uh, who, I don't know, see this, the, the newly consecrated bishop managed to enter the Soviet Union, but in the face of brutal Soviet repression, he and the men he consecrated had perforce, um, no choice of their own, to remain underground. So they had to... Uh, keep their apostolate secret. Uh, there, they would, there was, they would have definitely been persecuted, uh, even violently, had they been open in what they were doing. So, in, yeah, keep in mind that even even before the communist regime came into place, the church had all kinds of trouble in Russia. Uh, even, for example, to the extent that uh, the Tsar uh, forbade that uh, the Catholics in Russia. Uh, use any kind of uh, Russian rite. That, that was that was only schismatics allowed to use that. Only people who were part of the of the state-run church, the state-run schismatic Russian so-called Orthodox Church, were allowed to use any kind of other rite. Uh, Catholics had to use the Roman rite. So that's that's what they were used to uh, prior to uh, say, for, for for a long time now. So whatever tradi traditional Catholics who might be in Russia today, uh, would they they always want the Roman rite. And they want a celibate clergy because those were the only clergy who were able to do anything for them uh, for for a long time. I mean, that that goes back to the time of the czars. So this led Pius XI once again to press for a negotiated solution. The fact that the that the apostolate in Russia that he started by sending Debney undercover uh, was that had to be kept very much uh, very quiet, very much underground, and that led him to Pius XI to once again press for a negotiated solution, and he ordered Pacelli to reopen talks with the Soviet representatives in Berlin. The nuncio followed the papal instructions without comment or complaint, but once more privately expressed doubts that there could be any agreement with the existing Soviet regime, which he accurately claimed was determined to eliminate religion within its borders. So, uh, if, if, clearly, if a Pacelli thinks that a uh, diplomatic course will probably not be successful, that's almost certainly the case. <laughs> because they, clearly they will pursue them, Pacellis, or at least the Pacelli brothers, uh, the, the sons of Filippo Pacelli, uh, were committed to pursuing that as far as they possibly could. And then since they had been brought up with, that, with, that, with those ideas. Uh, remember being trained in, in the law and in diplomacy from really their earliest years. Uh, so, uh, Pius XI continued to press for some understanding with the Soviets until 1929 when Joseph Stalin introduced his state-sponsored program to eradicate religion in the Soviet Union. 
So it was when Stalin finally came in that, uh, okay, Pius XI and gave up on the idea of ever coming to any kind of official agreement with communist Russia. Stalin's program substantiated what Pacelli had long suspected, that it was difficult, if not impossible, for the Vatican to reach even a minimal understanding with the Soviet state. So that's just how anti-religious, completely anti-religious, uh, the communist Russia was, that it was impossible to have any kind of agreement at all. So it has been suggested that Pacelli had mixed feelings in 1929 when he heard that he was going to be recalled home and learned that his mentor and patron, Cardinal Gaspari, had resigned. So he was, around this time, Cardinal Gaspari was out as a Secretary of State. Uh, but his, as Pacelli's concerns were somewhat alleviated when he learned that he was to receive the red hat, that is to say the Cardinal's hat, at the end of 1929, and was to replace Gaspari as Cardinal Secretary of State at the opening of 1930. So, backing up here a few years, in 1922, after reputedly having helped secure Ratti's election, Gaspari could count on having the Pope's support. So the story is, again, uh, uh, Conclaves are supposed to be secret since St. Pius X, but uh, there, the story is that, remember, Ratti was the compromise candidate in 1922. The idea was that these, those who were supporting Cardinal Mary Doval, and they, when they clearly saw they could not get enough votes to elect Cardinal Mary Doval, that they decided, okay, fine, we'll, we'll put our votes behind Ratti, this compromise candidate, someone who is acceptable at least to both factions. But they did so on the condition, uh, made to Ratti himself, that he not make Cardinal Gaspari Secretary of State. But then he did make Cardinal Gaspari Secretary of State. Reputedly saying, well, any pro pro the, the, by, by law, all promises made in a conclave are, are annulled uh, at the end. They're, you cannot hold a new pope to any of that. So on that title, <laughs> he made Cardinal, uh, Cardinal Gaspari Secretary of State. So it is said. Again, how, how these rumors come about, you always have to track them, especially considering that conflicts are now supposed to be secret. But that is the story. So in other words, Cardinal Gaspari was well, really a, a modernizer, if not a modernist. Uh, he was, uh, you may remember that during the reign of St. Pius X, he, he gave uh, an explanation for how uh, two, two couple of modernists, I believe Buonaiuti was one of them, who, anyway, Buonaiuti was excommunicated by Benedict the Fifteenth. Uh, he gave an explanation and said, oh, here, here's how you can understand the anti-modernist oath in such a way that you can take it. That was Cardinal Gaspari who did that. So, the, uh, in 1922, uh, Gaspari, sorry, okay, I, I, was, I helped secure Ratti's election, that was the idea. I can count on his support, he can keep me in position. But as early as 1926, rumors spread that the Pope was unhappy with his Secretary of State. So, Definitely, he became unhappy with him, disillusioned with him, and wanted to get rid of him. Uh, and and uh, it was in July of 1929 that Pius XI first informed Gaspari that he thought it was time for a change and told him to think the matter over. In other words, it's a nice way of saying, I'm going to get rid of you. <laughs> think about whom you might want to have replace you. But he waited, he, the Pope, waited several months before actually making the change. In December, choosing his nuncio to Germany, Eugenio Pacelli, to be his new Secretary of State. So the old cardinal was convinced that Eugenio had connived with his brother Francesco and the Jesuits to push him out of the office he had occupied for a decade and a half. Pacelli denied the accusation and looked forward to returning home and assuming his new role. So my mission to Germany has come to an end, he said at the reception in his honor on the eve of his departure from the Weimar Republic, adding, a greater, more embracing task in the heart of the Universal Church now begins. So, now moving on to uh, Pacelli's career as Cardinal Secretary of State. So he brought back uh, a bit of Germany to Rome with him in the persons of his housekeeper, Sister Pascalina Leinart, uh, his private secretary, Father Robert Lieber, Monsignor Ludwig Ludwig Kass of the Center Party, and perhaps most tellingly, his con Jesuit confessor, Father Augustin Bea. So take, take note of that name. He'll come, it'll, it'll be very prominent uh, down the line uh, in, as part of the inner circle of Pope Pius XII. So Gaspari, though, in, 
1930 did not make Pacelli's transition easy. You have come to take my place, he growled shortly after Pacelli arrived in Rome. You should not have accepted. They have exploited me, and now they send me away. You will see what kind of man the Pope is. So clearly, Gaspari did not take this too well. <laughs> A distraught Pacelli did his best to calm him down, but the encounter left its mark. Yes? Father, we saw before that uh, Gaspari was like the mentor of the one that had yes. Pacelli. Yes, yes. And then he's doing this conversation? Yes, yes. No, he was clearly unhappy, very unhappy that Pacelli was brought in to replace him. So they have chased me out like a dog, the former Secretary of State kept repeating complaining to a fellow cardinal that in their final meeting, the Pope had not offered him a word of appreciation. Talking to another friend, he indignantly asked how the Pope could treat him so poorly. I am the one who made the librarian a Pope and a sovereign, and he chased me out worse than a mangy dog. He will pay me for it. Believe me, he will pay me for it. So, hardly an edifying reaction to this. And in, in many ways, uh, Pacelli was Gaspari's opposite. Recalled from Berlin and made a cardinal in December 1929, Pacelli was, in fact, made Secretary of State two months later. The short, stout, self-described sheep herder, Gaspari, uh, was replaced by a tall, slender, bespectacled Roman of aristocratic bearing, Pacelli. We've, we've seen his aristocratic background. In contrast to Gaspari, who rarely spoke publicly, Pacelli was a skilled orator. Up by 6.15 a.m., the new Secretary of State celebrated Mass with a group of priests and nuns before taking a quick breakfast. He then waited for the Pope's summons to their early morning meeting. So, meets, him with, meets with him every day, meets with Pius XI every day. A close, although formal, relationship developed between the scholarly, undiplomatic Pope, a modest uh, a man from a modest, small-town family, and the politically well-connected Roman Pacelli. So, remember that. Uh, it's true. Uh, when, when talking about the, like, uh, as, as, as nasty as he was in saying it, Cardinal Gaspari is actually just, was, in fact, pointing out the truth when he said that, uh, that Ratti was a librarian who became Pope. He was. I mean, we saw his, his various postings as a librarian throughout, uh, in, in his rise up through the, uh, through the ranks of the church. So he was indeed um, definitely scholarly and clearly had, did not have a diplomatic training, definitely not the kind of training that, that Pacelli or either, either Francesco, or the, the, lay, the layman and lawyer, or uh, Eugenio, the, now the cardinal diplomat, former nuncio to Germany, now secretary of state. So but, but clearly he would you know, he, he'd make use. Pius XI was clearly availing himself of their diplomatic skills. We'll see, we already saw that in Germany, and even with regard to Soviet Russia, he, he, he enlists Eugenio's help towards making some inroads, which I made quite, actually, actually quite a few in Germany, which, which we saw, and he did his best in Russia. So after a half-hour lunch break at uh, 1 p.m., Pacelli took tick. Uh, would take a, an hour off for a walk, sometimes in the gardens of the Villa Borghese, on the other side of the Tiber. Back in the Vatican, the Secretary of State had more appointments before taking time alone to go over the day's documents. At 8.30, he stopped for supper, went to the chapel to recite the rosary, and returned to work uh, until well after midnight. So, uh, also you know, backing up a little bit, uh, when, in, uh, when, in August 1926, Pius XI launched negotiations with Mussolini, negotiations which ultimately led to the Lateran Accords in 1929. He chose a layman, Francesco Pacelli, to serve as his personal representative. So uh, if, he if he avoided relying on his then Secretary of State, Gaspari, or any clergyman for that matter, for this purpose, uh, it was in good part because the Vatican still did not formally recognize the Italian state. So this was, remember, these were the negotiations whereby the, the state would give something to the church, the, the new Italian, the, the Masonic Italian kingdom would grant concessions to the church ultimately, and the church would recognize this new regime in, in return. Again, new being by this point 50 plus years in place was, was established. Well, the Italian kingdom was itself officially proclaimed in 1960, or 1861, and remember that Rome itself well, it was not seized until about, you know, 
not, not roughly 10 years later, not quite 10 years later. Uh, but uh, the the state the church still does not recognize this new this new kingdom, relatively new. And again, he calls upon and say clearly as he's um, uh, as he has. Uh, Eugenio is the uh, sought as the nuncio to Germany, involved in negotiations. Uh, he has his, the, 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 the lay uh, lawyer brother in, uh, involved in the negotiations with Mussolini. So clearly availing himself of the diplomatic talents of the Pacellis, uh, which uh, perhaps seeing that his own methods would not get any concessions. Uh, not, not to say that. Uh, in, intransigence is, is a, a bad thing in itself, but he saw that, okay, for if, when, if, if it comes down to making concessions and negotiations, then I am going to need somebody with, with training in that. And so he, he clearly saw the Pacelli's talent for that sort of thing and called upon them to, to help him in it. So the, the, although the Pope and Mussolini were eager to keep the talks secret, there was no lack of gossip. Given that it's happening in Italy, that's really not all that surprising that word should get out. Uh, it reached as far as Chicago, where a new account told of the Duce's purported eagerness to create a city of the Pope. So remember that, uh, contrary to some absurd statements made by Mussolini that we saw last year, it is, uh, it is actually Italy that greatly benefits by having uh, Rome, the capital of the church, within its borders. Uh, then they just think about Rome today, all the reasons that people go to visit either that city itself or any place else in, in Italy, it's to see well, the churches in Rome. It's to see the, the, uh, the magnificent uh, culture or what's left of it uh, that was uh, formed by, um, in the, under the influence of the Catholic faith. Uh, what, think of what's left of ancient pagan Rome. Nobody goes to Rome just to see the ruins of the Roman Forum, for example. Nobody, nobody goes there to see that, or the revolutionary monuments that were put up after 1870. Nobody goes there for that purpose. They all go to see uh, the church, the churches, everything set up under the influence of the church, under the influence of the faith. Uh, all that, that is the attraction of it all. Uh, just think about what Italy would be without that would be something like Greece, a place of some historical interest, but just think of what Athens is today. Yes, a place with some historical uh, landmarks, but other than that, little more than a giant apartment complex. <laughs> uh, that's what R Rome would be something like that today, were it not for huge crowds of tourists coming from all over the world. You go there, yes, I remember uh, being there, I've only been able to get there once myself, but uh, you hear English spoken with an American accent everywhere. <laughs> Americans come from all over, uh, and uh, not, not and, well, people from all kinds of different countries come. I remember seeing a group of Koreans there, for example. Uh, people come from all over. I, uh, Italy is number one country for tourism in the world. It is the top industry in Italy, and it is the the, the number one country for tourism, even uh, even ahead of France, in fact. So it is all of that is due to the influence of the faith. That is what to this day attracts people to it to see the. The, what's left anyway of the of Catholic culture there. So remember Mussolini saying, "Oh, the the, the 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 church owes as much to Italy as as Italy does to the church, or even more." Uh, that that's definitely not true. But you, you see why Mussolini was so eager to well, he was willing to make concessions because he needs to uh, have a, say put put a good face on relations with the Holy See. Uh, because that, that is at, at the center of all of it. Without, without the papacy, uh, what would Italy become? And even remember, even Leo XIII uh, also uh, at one point threatened, uh, probably with very little seriousness, uh, with, as I say, with little intention of actually going through with it, but he threatened at, at certain points to leave, to leave Italy. And that scared the Italian government at that time enough that he was able to get concessions from them. Because that would be, that's just, that's, clearly that is worst case scenario for the Italian state, is to, is to either to lose the presence of the Pope or to have a, a publicly bad relations with the Holy See. And Pius XI clearly was of such a temperament and such a character that he had no problem initiating public confrontations and conflicts. Uh, and Mussolini definitely wanted to avoid that. 
So he was willing to negotiate with the Pope, who was of such a, a temperament. So, uh, the, uh, the Duce, uh, Mussolini, of course, is um, uh, definitely willing to negotiate because of all of that, sensitive to the rumors, to this effect of his desire to create a city of the Pope. Romans began, somewhat amusingly, scrutinizing real estate sales as a story was making the rounds that the Pope was quietly buying up property with the goal of creating a papal state that would stretch from St. Peter's to the sea. Not actually the case, but that's how... Uh, that was the extent to which these rumors were scrutinized. Uh, the course of negotiations was anything but smooth. Reports of fascist violence against Catholic action groups often provoked the Pope's anger. Uh, early in 1926, upset by the latest reports of violence against the Catholic action headquarters, this time in the northern city of Brescia, the Pope told Taki Venturi to lodge a complaint which was not the first time he had instructed his go-between to do so. Remember, his father, Taki Venturi, a Jesuit, uh, was set up as a back-channel communication uh, between the Holy See and the Italian state. Again, unofficial, uh, something, like, uh, the, 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 uh, so, something along the lines that, uh, along the lines along which uh, uh, Francesco Pacelli was chosen to negotiate these accords, uh, being uh, a layman, therefore not a... Uh, not, not a member of the hierarchy of the church, uh, but still being called upon to assist in these matters. So this Father Taki Venturi was set up as an unofficial back-channel go-between uh, between the Holy See and the Italian state, which it did not officially recognize. So, uh, we, we, saw, we saw more of the details of that last year. This, this is a, a condensed version of what we're looking at right here. And these notes is a condensed version uh, of what we saw in more detail last year, which was the, the extent to which the, uh, the Italian state perpetrated violence, or either itself or, or people aligned with it, uh, perpetrated violence against Catholic action groups. I mean, remember, Catholic action groups, groups of, a little more than that, groups of Catholic laymen who were involved in uh, f uh, say furthering the interests of the church in, in various different ways uh, in, within their capacity. So uh, th this meant to a great extent uh, in, in politics as well, and it was a group that Mussolini did not control. Remember, Mussolini wanted total control of everything in, in the, in, within Italy. In fact, that's the very idea of fascism, you know, the lo the, since the logo of, of fascism is that, is that uh, bundle of axes. In fact, the very term fascist is derived from the term for that bundle of axes. And uh, that's the idea that everything is bound up in the state. Everything is controlled by the state. And here you have this Catholic action, these Catholic action groups, uh, which do not answer to the state, which Mussolini cannot control, and that's something that makes him very uncomfortable. And, either, uh, and when violence is perpetrated against them, uh, he would say, you might remember that from last year, he would say, oh, yes, we're, we're, we will... We'll bring these people uh, uh, to justice. We'll, we'll discipline those who perpetrate the violence. But there was little to nothing was, was done to stop it. And that was something that was a constant source of irritation to Pius XI, who was clearly not of the temperament to, to, uh, to, to keep it quiet when he, when he had a source of irritation that was bothering him. So uh, he is, uh, lodges more than one complaint uh, by means of his, his, his back-channel communications, go between Taki Venturi, uh, uh, trying to get Mussolini to put an end to this violence. That was, this was not the first time. Uh, in early 1927, upset not only by the dissolution of the Catholic Boy Scouts, uh, but also by signs that the ban would soon extend to Catholic action youth groups, the Pope ordered the talks uh, suspended. He sent Taki Venturi to give Mussolini an ultimatum. Unless he relented, he could forget about reaching a deal on the Roman question. And that's, uh, that was a real threat to Mussolini. So, realizing the danger of overplaying his hand, in late February 1927, Mussolini sent word to his prefects to leave the Catholic action groups alone. So, finally, at that point, he's sending out official word, if nothing else, giving himself a degree of what they call deniability, that if any further violence happens, well, I said not to do it. Uh, somebody else, somebody else acting, some, some rogue agent or agents perhaps doing it. But I, I don't want that to happen. Uh, 
So I remember that Mussolini uh, uh, was was trying was seeking to use the church and and the pope himself to his advantage, and Pius XI was trying to do the same for with Mussolini. Yeah, I remember you saw all of the the decorations and all of the honors that he gave to Mussolini. Not that he had any personal use for him. Not that he entertained any any um, uh, um, I say uh, any kind of of. Humanly speaking, any kind of hope of making a Mussolini into a, a good Catholic, uh, or uh, or anything like that, but he did have the idea that we can we can use this man who is uh, who is who is in power very very clearly the very popular dictator here. We can use him to further the interests of the church. So uh, Mussolini wanted to use the, the church and the pope, and the, and the pope Pius XI wanted to use Mussolini, and so they had this this constant uh, this constant battle of well, the way, nicest way to put it, be battle of wits going on between them. Uh, this constant negotiation: who who can who can use the other better? It was a constant uh, struggle, constant uh, uh, say constant game almost to see who could do that. And the uh, you know, worst case scenario for Mussolini would be nothing happens and clear, the Holy See is, remains clearly inimical to, uh, the, to his regime and maybe even denounces it publicly. So that, that would be that's worst case scenario for Mussolini that he wants to avoid. So Pius XI was pleased with Mussolini's sending out word to leave Catholic action groups alone. Uh, over the next months, the negotiations continued, and the Pope met with Pacelli, Francesco Pacelli, uh, several times a week. So you see, he has working very closely with both of the with the Pacelli brothers, with um, giving all kinds of instructions to Eugenio in in Germany, and uh, meeting with Francesco personally, uh, uh, very frequently, several times a week, uh, to get updates on how the negotiations are going. Fresh reports of fascist violence against local Catholic uh, groups uh, would come in, Catholic action groups, would come in from time to time, and the Pope would again threaten to break off the talks. But by now he had too much invested in the negotiations and too much in his support for Mussolini and the fascist regime to risk having them fail. So everybody's clearly become very invested in this, and you see on the part of Pius XI, that's due uh, to, to a great extent, to the efforts of, of a Pacelli. And we'll see that. Uh, Pius XI may have had, uh, so he definitely was not past, at least threatening to break off talks, but who is it who is uh, commissioned to keep them going? It's a Pacelli. And we'll see that, uh, that uh, Cardinal Pacelli, at least we touched upon it last year, would pull back Pius XI on, on many occasions when he was inclined to come out swinging, so to speak. On February 7th, 1929, Cardinal Gaspari called in the ambassadors to the Holy See. You know, at this point, uh, he's still, Cardinal Gaspari is still Secretary of State, and told them that a historic agreement was soon to be announced, ending the decades-long dispute between the Church and the Italian government. The day after, Gaspari assembled the diplomats in the Vatican to tell them the news. Mussolini sent a telegram to all of Italy's ambassadors with the same message. And the final details of the Lateran Accords were ironed out by Mussolini and Francesco Pacelli on Saturday evening, February 9th, 1929. So we went into the details of this last year, so we'll move, well, this is to a great extent a review, but again, this time really our focus is on the fact of just how much involved the Pacellis are. So the first article specified that the Catholic faith was the only religion of the state. Uh, does not seem to be saying that it's the only uh, religion uh, recognized period, which of course is what the church always wants. Not only this is the religion of state or the main religion in the state, but the only religion, not only of the state, but the only religion recognized by the state. So uh, that was definitely, uh, wording it that way was something of a concession, perhaps not perfect, but definitely something of a concession to the church on the part of the state. Uh, the uh, accord had three parts. Uh, the first, the treaty proper, established Vatican City as a sovereign territory under papal rule in which the Italian government had no right to interfere. The, sec and the second part of the Lateran Accords, the Concordat, governed relations between the Holy See and the Italian government. The Italian government, as part of this, would not allow anything to take place in Rome that would interfere with the Vatican's character as the sacred center of the Catholic world. 
The third and final part of the Accords consisted of a financial agreement. Italy would pay 750 million lira, plus 1 billion lira in Italian bonds, totaling roughly $1 billion, uh, 2013 U.S. dollars, in exchange for the Holy See's agreement to give up all claims for the loss of its papal states. So, all of that we covered last year in more detail, uh, but it was on the first anniversary of the Lateran Accords in February of 1930 uh, that Eugenio Pacelli was uh, inaugurated. Uh, that was, his, so to speak, he was brought into his position as uh, Secretary of State on the first anniversary of the signing of the Lateran Accords, and he was immediately uh, swept up uh, in the celebrations. On the anniversary itself, the Italian ambassador presented the Pope with a beautiful surplus made of Burano lace, which the Pope told the Italian ambassador to the Vatican, Cesare di Vecchi, that he would wear it the next day in the Sistine Chapel for the ceremonies, marking his eighth anniversary as pontiff. Remember, he was elected in February of 1922, so you have this coming together of these two different anniversaries. And also, we'll look at this last part here, De Vecchi thought, who is the Italian ambassador to the Vatican, thought that Pacelli, Eugenio Pacelli, was a man with whom he could work well. This Cardinal Secretary of State, De Vecchi recorded in his diary, seems to me to be basically a good person, with whom, as time goes on, we will find complete harmony, that of a true conciliation. If the Pope, Pius XI, weren't so agitated, things would go much more smoothly. So, we'll see that this, uh, that's just the beginning of things to come.